Hello and welcome back. Chris here with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another tabletop review and comparison. Today we're going to be taking a look at the very popular and iconic Single Action Army. Now over here I have a line of original Colt Single Action Army revolvers, and over here I have a pretty interesting animal. This is a standard manufacturing Single Action Revolver, which is actually still being made today. I'm going to take a look at the two basic uh, lines here from Colt compared to the standard manufacturing offering get into a little bit of the history of the single action army, and then do a head to head comparison to kind of give you guys an idea of what standard manufacturing got right and how they do line up against their Colt counterparts. So if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around, it's coming up now. Okay, so jumping into this video, let me first go over what it is exactly I have here on the table. As mentioned, these are all Colts, and this one is made by Standard Manufacturing. Now up here at the top, I have a seven and a half inch barrel, 45 Colt chambered single action army. This is in the blued finish with the color case hardened frame chambered in 45 Colt, as mentioned. Now this one down here is in the same finish, but in the five and a half inch barrel, this is a third generation made in about 1972. This one was made in 1958. Here I have another second generation, this one with the nickel finish with four and three quarter inch barrel, also N45 Colt. Now you saw in the intro, I do have a match set here, a sequential serial number, so very cool. And But I'm going to leave the second one out since this one's identical to it, essentially. And then here I have a first generation made in 1904, chambered in 38 WCF with a four and three quarter inch barrel. It was originally blued with a color case hardened frame, but age has sort of turned it mostly into patina, but a nice classic looking revolver. Now over here is going to be the main focal point of this video. This is the standard manufacturing single action revolver that they manufacture today. This one here is in the seven and a half inch barrel, although they make them in the classic different barrel lengths, the five and a half and the four and three quarter as well. Uh, but I wanted the seven and a half inch barrel for a couple of reasons, some of which I'll go through in this video. Beautiful color case hardened frame, blued barrel, uh, two piece walnut grips, color case hardened hammer, just a gorgeous representation and bar borrows some characteristics of the different generations, which again, we will talk as we, uh, or go over as we go through this video. Now, first, I always like to start on this channel with a little bit of historical context, what the single action army essentially is and it's the lineage that has led it up to today. So really the story can begin with the Roland White patent of 1855. Now that was a patent enjoyed by Smith & Wesson, which gave them exclusive rights to the bore through cylinder, although they did pay a royalty uh, to White in the matter of about 25 cents per unit sold. And Smith & Wesson used that patent to their advantage to come out with some pretty innovative revolver designs, most notably the number three, which was their large frame revolver, later revised by Schofield. We hear it referred to often as the Schofield. That's when he would design a latching system so it could be easier to reload on horseback. So because of that, that would be used really extensively with the United States Cavalry going on into the future. Now, in 1872, the Roland White patent would expire. This would give other manufacturers, such as Colt, the ability to come out with a board through cylinder self-contained cartridge revolver of their own. And quickly, Colt would get to work coming up with a design that would essentially turn into this. Now, two of Colt's master gunsmiths, they were William Mason and Charles Richards, would quickly get to work on coming up with the new single action army design in 1872. Now, also, the United States military had put through a request for a new service sidearm. Colt wanted to be able to have an entrant into that uh, competition, knowing that they were going up against Smith & Wesson revolvers, again, specifically the number three large frame top break revolver. They knew they couldn't stick with the earlier designs, the cap and ball type uh, loaded mechanism they would have to come up with a revolver that was uh, that had a bore through cylinder that used a self-contained cartridge and this is what they would come up with in 1873 the 1873 single action army uh, also given the nickname the peacemaker now effectively what you have here single action would indicate that the hammer would have to go all the way back and then could be fired between each shot the uh, revolver did not incorporate a swing out cylinder. It was not top break. The cylinder was pretty much fixed inside the frame during use. Now you could take the cylinder out for cleaning and maintenance and things like that. But during operation, the cylinder would stay put. To load it, you would open the side loading gate here, go back to half cock, load your rounds. You could load six if you wanted to. Typical uh, loading practices were load one chamber, skip one chamber, then load four, then lower the hammer on a empty, uh, empty chamber so you didn't risk, you know, negligent discharges or anything like that. 
So these would actually stay in production from 1873 until about 18, I'm sorry, until about 1940 with the offset of the American involvement in the Second World War. Now Colt did have military contracts for things like the 1911 earlier on, the 1911A1 later on. This was obviously by the 1940s antiquated military technology. This firearm had been replaced itself in military service in around the 1890s. Um, so it did not make sense to be producing these during wartime necessity and even further through uh, the, the 1920s through the 1930s, demand for the single action army was waning anyway, so it made sense to discontinue production on these, focus on wartime use, unless of course you were General Patton with the iconic ivory gripped single action army, he might argue with that. but. Anyway, very cool. Now, in about the 1950s, 1955, Ruger would actually come out with the Black Hawk revolver. It was a single action army-esque type of design. It had been reinforced in certain areas and would use things like updated sights and things like that. You can still find the Black Hawk revolvers today on the market. Now, also at this time, culturally, there was a huge amount of interest in the Western genre of entertainment. There were TV shows and movies that were coming out showcasing things like the single action army, which was one of the reasons Ruger would come out with things like the 22 versions of the single six and later the Bearcat and the Black Hawk revolvers. Now, Colt had noticed that a competitive manufacturer, Ruger, is actually making a lot of headwind with a single action design, which was Colt's to begin with. So Colt would follow suit a year later in about 1956 and re-released the line with very little to no changes at all to their original pattern. Now this wouldn't be known as the so-called second generation of the single action army of which this is and this and it's twin over here uh, which should be about 1956 up to about uh, late 1960 I don't know the date specifically around 1969 to 1971 somewhere around there that the changeover would happen where a couple other changes would be made Part of the way through the second generation manufacturing, some elements in the hammer would be replaced from a fixed firing pin to a floating firing pin. I'll go over that as well. Um, but generally, without a, a couple minor revisions, the first single action armies made in 1873 all the way up to the last single action armies made up until about uh, 2019 or 2020 were virtually no different. Although there is not entirely parts interchangeability, especially earlier versions being hand fitted and things like that. Now, there are a couple companies that have come up with, I guess you could call them their own take or representation or remakes on the design of which standard manufacturing is one. Now, the most popular one that everybody's familiar with out there on the market are the ones manufactured in Italy by Uberti, which are marketed here in the United States by Cimarron and Taylor. They are effectively all guns from Uberti. The two importers just market and brand them a little bit differently. And those are a little bit on the lower end, around the $500 range or so brand new. And they have nicer models that go upwards of six, $700 and so. There are a couple, there was a US, uh, uh, or USNF uh, manufacturing company that had a, a very nice, well-made reproduction as well. Very high quality. That company has since uh, gone out of business. The uh, owner of that just decided to close it down. But that was a very good higher end manufactured version of that revolver. But when they left, they left a market open. Now, Colt would manufacture the single action army for order out of their custom shop. Uh, they came out of main standard run production. I want to say around like 2016, 2017, somewhere in there. But you can still order even today on their website a custom manufactured single action army. They're quite expensive to have them custom made for you. Uh, and there's a, a six month plus lead time on that. So there was a, a, an opportunity in the market for another uh, company to come out with a standard production run of, I guess, higher end, uh, well manufactured, sort of hand fit and finished, if you would, single action armies. And that is what standard manufacturing did around the time Colt would exit the standard line production, moving everything to the custom shop about five or so years ago. Um, we will get into the design elements of this, but if you look at the manufacturing quality, it is very obvious that they meet, if not exceed, the manufacturing uh, you know, commitment that has been put in to the single action army ranging from the first all the way through the third generation. And they have a lot of different offerings that meet the, the different uh, you know, market offerings from the Colt line. Uh, Sander Manufacturing has done the same thing as well uh, with, with their revolvers in terms of what you can purchase and things like that. And we'll go through that in the recap of this video.
Okay, so I've removed the other single action armies from the table, and we're going to focus mainly on these as we look through our head-to-head -head comparison. Very quickly, a recap. Both of these are, are in the 7.5 inch barrel length, although other options are available in both the Colt and standard manufacturing, as we have discussed. Now, personally, I prefer the 7.5 inch barrel. I'm somewhat of a military arms collector and enthusiast myself. And the 7.5 inch barreled version was the first version adopted by the United States military for at known as the cavalry model. Now later a shorter 5.5 inch barrel like this one would be adopted for use with the artillery and that would be known as such as the artillery length. Now the 4 and 3 quarter inch barrel like this is often referred to by collectors as like the gunfighter model if not you know a couple other names. Typically the type that you would see popularized in western type culture this was more of a commercial offering shorter barrel meant less accuracy but was more concealable and easier to carry which is why they are oftentimes more or less featured in sort of the western uh, genre uh, type films uh, but commercially for the civilian market it was typically the four and three quarter and five and a half inch barreled options that would typically be found uh, again outside of the military but I, I just think the classic lines of the seven and a half inch barrel is just a stunning type of look now, when it came to manufacture the single action army, there were, were a lot of uh, different sort of specifications that you could choose to have on your revolver dating back to the first generation. Even on through the second generation, you could customize it and special order these things through Colt. Uh, but they would also have typical standardized production. And in the standardized production with Colt, you would have things like the uh, the most popular was the color case hardened frame with the blued uh, cylinder and barrel and ejector spring housing and the trigger guard is simply down here with the back strap and whatnot uh, but you could also get them factory nickeled as well or all blued now standard manufacturing has kept in line with that their two finish offerings are the color case hardening as well and they also have a nickeled variation um, the color case hardening in general so if you look at sort of less expensive offerings from places like Taylor. Uh, the color case hardening on here is actually done through a chemical process. Now what gives it this sort of unique marbling on the finish is through a process of the actual color case hardening where you take a softer metal and you harden the outer layer of the metal by putting it through a heating process. You typically put the parts in a compound made of charcoal, bone, and wood put it into a crucible and then heat it up to about 1500 degrees, uh, back it off to about 1200 degrees and let it sit for a couple hours, uh, put it in sort of sterilized water and then let it cool. And then what you're left with is this very nice sort of marbling color. Now, because, you know, through the processing of this, every single sort of uh, you know characteristic of, of the marbling a type of texture is unique to the firearm that's being color case hardened at that time so there are no two in existence from any type of actual color case hardening process that are going to be identical now again as mentioned the cheaper offerings or i should say less expensive offerings from places like taylor or uberti uh, that's done through a chemical process a lot less expensive now through standard manufacturing the color case hardening on this is absolutely gorgeous as you can see and like colt they use the actual traditional method of color case hardening so this is real color case hardening on the frame and hammer of this firearm now when it comes to the hammer uh, earlier first generation colts could be found with color case hardening on the hammer uh, in fact this one still has some remnants of color case hardening on it um, if I look sort of at the base of the hammer and on the front of the hammer, I can see, you can see a little bit of marbling texture in here that this one was originally a color case hardened hammer, but largely definitely by second generation, uh, they had gotten away, Colt had gotten away from the color case hardening on the hammers and had gone to a sort of a polished metal look uh, for the blued and color case hardened guns with a blue top and back strap and then a nickeled hammer. Uh, this one's been a little bit modified, but it is an original cold hammer or a nickel, uh, straight nickeled hammer for the nickeled gun. Now, <clears throat> Sander Manufacturing did not stick generally or specifically to a particular generation of manufacturer. You're going to find elements of the three different generations in the gun. But the uh, color case hardened hammer on this would definitely be an earlier first generation element that they've incorporated on this. But through their processing, just the beautiful blues and purples and browns and grays uh, that sort of just mesh into the hammer itself just gives it a very pleasing aesthetic look, which is undoubtedly just, just beautiful to look at. It's very much a piece of art done through the traditional methods. Now, as mentioned, we were talking about the grips. Techn uh, typically, what you would find through standard, uh, through baseline manufacturing, through Colt, is sort 
sort of this hard rubber uh, type grip. You can see the manufacturing is a little bit dense. This is definitely a more rubberized type uh, material here on this first generation. This is feels a little bit more plastic, but but a nice hard and higher quality plastic, I guess you could say. Uh, but they would also you could get these from the uh, from Colt. Uh, with ivory, with pearl, with uh, just slab wood grips like this, or with this typical type of plastic ask looking grip panel. But as you add a different uh, grip types to it in your order, uh, the price would go up. And the same is true here with standard manufacturing. So uh, what they offer here is this is their base model two piece walnut grip, which looks fantastic. They go through multiple different layers of finishing process on the grips themselves. So this just again looks fantastic. Uh, and this is in their base package, what you see here. Uh, kind of where it starts. Now you can change, uh, you can upgrade the grips. You can go to a checkered two-piece walnut. You can go to a walnut one-piece or you can go to a faux ivory uh, sort of white grips. Um, and as you add those different elements, the, the cost of the firearm goes up about $150 to $250 or so as you add those different grip types. Okay, let's go ahead and get a closer look at the barrel. And this is on the original Colt. So again, seven and a half inch barrel blued and the bluing matches the ejector spring housing here on the bottom of the firearm, which travels a little bit more than about 50% of the length of the barrel itself. You're going to see the front sight post here is non-adjustable and it does have a nice rounded edge on the front. It's more flat shooter facing towards the back. Uh, and of course, if you want to, I've seen people who will either either file down the post or add a, a layer of brass to the top or a brass bead to sort of heighten and lower uh, the front sight to sort of change your elevation on it. Although on an original Colt, I don't recommend that anymore, but I have seen it done. Or people have switched out sights uh, entirely by removing the front sight and putting on, you know, king sights were popular in the 30s, or I should say later on, more like the, the 50s or so. 50s and 60s, so you would see that as well. Now, taking a look at the roll markings here on the left hand side of the barrel, it says Colt's Single Action Army 45, there's caliber designation. And right up here at the top is Colt PTFA Manufacturer Company, Hartford, Connecticut, USA. Now, bringing in the standard manufacturing for comparison, it looks almost identical. It is a blued seven and a half inch barrel with blued ejector spring housing, which again travels about the same length at the as the bottom of the barrel. The front sight setup is identical. Again, rounded at the front, flattened towards the back end. Now, the sight picture through these, I've looked through them, this sits a little bit higher up above the sight picture. Uh, some people have said that there have been needs, uh, I haven't shot this, but just watching videos on YouTube, uh, have needed to sort of use Kentucky windage when adjusting their point of impact, uh, point of aim, and that's gonna be true on a cold as well. So it's very hard to find one that hits exactly dead nuts where you're aiming, um, but some sort of Kentucky windage would be necessary with any type of fixed sight revolver. Now again, on the left-hand side of the firearm on the Colt, it was Colt Single Action Army followed by the caliber. This one just has the caliber markings here on this side. The manufacturer markings for standard manufacturing is right up here at the top. Very much the same sort of almost same font and stylizing and placement as exactly is found on the Colt. So the roll markings are almost the same. Of course, standard manufacturing has got to change things up a little bit because they are not Colt. So they have to put their own roll markings on there, but they have really obviously due to the placement tried to say sort of true to the form of Colt. Uh, again, I don't believe standard manufacturer is really trying to copy the Colt in every regard, but for those of us who are sort of Colt single action army aficionados, kind of having this the similarities is kind of a nice touch in my opinion. And you're going to notice down here the little uh, catch or the lever or finger rest, whatever you want to call it, on the ejector. Uh, here it has this really nice pronounced blue. It's like almost blue in color instead of typical black, uh, like we saw on the Colt Single Action Army. So again, a very nice touch matching the base pin as well and the screw heads. Just a, a lot of attention paid to the aesthetics of this revolver. Okay, so here's the frame on the Colt variant. Again, color case hardened. Um, the color case hardening on this is a little bit softer, a little bit duller in color, but remember this one was made in 1958. So uh, it is uh, quite a bit older. It has seen some use. The standard manufacturing version I have is, it, it is factory new, has not even been fired. Uh, so obviously the colors are going to be a little bit more rich and these were probably a little bit richer back in their day but it is real color case hardening that has been done here if we look at the internal of the frame the machining work is pretty much flawless i see you know no machining marks polished down nice and well very flush fit very smooth no burrs no sort of uh, any type of machining issues in there loading gate here pops right out now this is a mem part as well as the trigger guard assembly not made out of steel like the rest of the frame, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. 
Now on this side, it does have the patent information as well as the pony that's going to be found on a Colt, sort of their branding as well, which everybody likes to see obviously on a genuine Colt single action army. Here is the frame on the standard manufacturing off offering. Again, that beautiful rich gives you guys that nice close up of that beautiful authentic color case hardening that's found on the hammer as well. It's just a gorgeous thing to look at. Now, if we look at the machining processes as well, this is just very smooth, very well machined. I do not see any obvious machining marks on the inside. Obviously, this has been very well, uh, a lot of uh, care and detail was put into this as it was assembled. Uh, just a gorgeous machining process that's been applied here. Now, the roll markings on this side, this does share uh, the sort of same placement of the patent date information here. Of course, you do not have the Colt Prancing Pony because this is not a Colt, uh, not meant to be a clone of a Colt as well. Now, the loading gate here is actually a steel manufactured part, same material that's used on the frame, which is gonna give you just that extra little added detail in terms of the manufacturing. So uh, really nice to have those stronger reinforced parts, even if it's not really necessarily needed in those areas, they're not high stress areas. Same down here with the trigger guard, full steel construction, uh, not a mem or cast part. Sorry about the focus there, which is found on especially later Colt single action army offering. So again, a lot of the detail has been paid there to the manufacturing of this frame. One other detail I did want to point out while we are looking here is remember those screw heads are all have that sort of really nice blue type finish to go along with the trigger as well. And notice that the screw heads are all timed to the same position. And that is going to be true throughout the entirety of the revolver. All these screw heads are timed to the same direction. Uh, so that is actually a pretty cool sort of interesting touch that has been added to the manufacturing that's not necessary and Colt never really did that uh, themselves, but just kind of goes to show you the extra little bit of detail that has been put into this. Serial number information is going to be found on the bottom of the trigger guard assembly as well as on the bottom of the frame and then the bottom of the grip. That is how first generation guns would be serialized by Colt. By the time they went to the second generation, they would be marked only here and then on the inside of the uh, trigger, I want to say yeah, the, uh, the grip frame assembly underneath here and on the trigger frame. Uh, so those other parts were internal. Now the numbering that would be found on the back of the loading gate, which this has. See if this is actually matching, nine, five. Yeah, so uh, what standard manufacturing has done is they have put a serial number on the loading gate as well, which does match the rest of the gun. On a typical Colt, you have an assembly number on that part that never typically matches the rest of the firearm unless uh, out of, uh, I should say, a coincidence. Uh, but that, when you get a Colt, if it's all matching, that number typically does not match the rest of the gun, but it does on this. And here is the first generation gun. And as you can see, the serial number placement is in exactly the same place. The bottom of the grip, uh, trigger group assembly frame, I guess you would call it um, trigger guard assembly and the bottom of the uh, frame itself as well. So if we look at the top of the frame of each, you're gonna notice that the sighting channel here on the Colt is a little bit wider than here on the standard manufacturing. But that is really the only obvious difference that I can find between the two frames, at least stylistically and through manufacturing process. Now let's take a look at the hammer. Now on a typical single action army, you're gonna get, and this is the Colt, you're gonna get four clicks. One, two, three, four, or people count out C-O-L-T for the four clicks. Your full cock position obviously is going to be for firing. Your half cock position here is gonna be for loading and unloading. Now, Colt would use basically two different types of hammers through production, and I'm gonna call them sort of a first and second generation and then the third generation. Uh, on this one here, this is a first to second generation hammer, and the main difference is, is the firing pin is actually fixed. It does not move at all. It is wedged into this channel and then a cross pin is put through. If you wanna take that out, you knock out that cross pin or rivet, some people call, take out the firing pin, but since it's sort of held in under pressure, there is a channel here in the back, you're gonna see a little hole, and you use a punch to go in through the back of the hammer to punch that out. Now, if we look at sort of a later third generation, or I should say second to third, because the change actually happened during the second generation. Um, check this one. This is a uh, second, a late second to third generation hammer uh, that is in this gun, it is original, but it's a second generation gun, it's probably replaced. Um, or I don't know if the change happened by 1960, which is when this one was made. But you're gonna notice there's no channel actually here in the back and the firing pin itself has wiggle to it. Some people have 
gotten these guns not knowing much about them and think their firing pin is loose and about to come out. There is actually some play that would be given to them later on, so less fitting would need to be required. There is sort of a conical shaped opening for the firing pin to pass through, and that would allow extra clearance for the firing pin to sort of move itself and index itself through that hole. If you had a fixed firing pin and it didn't line up exactly to the firing pin hole, then obviously the firing pin would sort of scrape on the frame, uh, not allowing clear access to the back of the primer. Now on the standard manufacturing version, you get four clicks as well. One, two, three, four. So again, very much in line with the Colt offering. And this is more of a first to early second generation hammer. You have that clearance channel right here in the back and it is a fixed firing pin. So this has obviously been very much fitted to the gun and it has the earlier firing pin and hammer configuration. Okay, so let's take a look at the cylinders. This one is from the second generation Colt. Obviously six round capacity as mentioned and it does have the rampant Colt Pony here and the serial number here on the face of the cylinder. Now this is a two piece, uh, what you would call two piece cylinder with a removable bushing um, and not much else really to say about that one. Now if I bring in the standard manufacturing cylinder, it is also blue just like on the Colt, also using the two piece cylinder and bushing. Now this would be how Colt would manufacture their uh, cylinders uh, up until about the midpoint of the third generation when they would actually go to a fixed bushing inside and then later they would revert back to the two-piece bushing here. Uh, but standard manufacturing has opted to stick with the two-piece bushing, which again, a lot of Colt single action collectors prefer. Now this one also has the serial number scribed on the cylinder as well, a very nice detail with no markings on the cylinder face. Now, in terms of interchangeability, the standard manufacturing frame is just slightly bigger than the Colt. Uh, hard to catch with the naked eye, but if you use uh, you know, different types of gauges, you could probably sort of measure that out. It is a little bit bigger. Uh, so the Colt cylinder does fit and turn inside of the standard manufacturing frame, but the standard manufacturing cylinder will not fit inside the Colt frame. So here is the frame, or I should say the grip on the second uh, generation Colt. You see the rampant Colt pony. This is typically the grip configuration you find on them. Although you could get them factory with ivory, with pearl, with the slab, wood uh, that oftentimes have the Colt Pony emblem. There have been tons and tons of aftermarket grips uh, manufactured by all variety of different people for these. A stag as well, so you can buy them and sort of fit them to your gun. Uh, every grip set fits a little bit differently, so you'd have to sort of match up the grips to your gun uh, and do some fitting on some of the aftermarket stuff. Uh, but there is that option. These are the grips on the first generation Colt Single Action Army. Again, it has the Rampant Colt logo. The grips feel a little bit more rubberized. They just feel a little bit more pliable, uh, like there's a little tiny amount of give in them, uh, not as solid as the second generation. They feel less plasticky and a little bit more rubbery. Um, they're not like, you know, Hogue rubbery, but uh, definitely some sort of rubberized plastic material. I'm not too up on my, you know, different build materials these days, but just a different sort of uh, texture and feel to them. And then here are the grips on the third generation Colt, which has the rampant pony again, and sort of this uh, coat of arms eagle uh, emblem down here. And that is the same uh, on both sides. Uh, again, sort of having that more plastic type feel that uh, that is on the second generation. Here are those grips on the standard manufacturing. Again, this is the standard option to piece walnut that has a very nice aesthetic to them. Uh, the upgrades include uh, uh, grips like this that are hand checkered. You can get the one piece walnut or you can get the faux ivory that are nice and white. Again, your pricing will go up with those options. All right, guys, let's go ahead and take a look at the weight starting here with the standard manufacturing. We are at two pounds, 7.2 ounces. And on the coat, two pounds, 7.4. So the Colt, I don't know if it matters, 7.3. Probably doesn't matter how it's sitting on here. So two pounds, 7.4. So we're sitting at almost exactly the same weight, two pounds, 7.4, two pounds, 7.2. So two ounces heavier actually on the Colt, which is interesting because the standard manufacturing has a slightly, slightly larger frame. And these components are steel, whereas these are sort of mem cast parts. Uh, maybe due to the wood paneling, I'm sure might be the difference. I don't know, but it's, I mean, it's virtually the same. Okay, let's take a look at the trigger pull weight of each of these. Two pounds, 0 0.9 ounces. One pound, 12 ounces. I'll try that one more time. One 
one pound, 11 ounces. So obviously a much lighter trigger here. This again was made in the uh, 1950s. So uh, something could have been done with the trigger. Let's just take another one from, you know what? We'll take the third gen from 1972 and we'll test it out. if I cock the hammer. Two pounds, two pounds, nine ounces on this one. I'll try that one more time. Two pounds, 8.8 .8 ounces. So uh, this one is sort of sitting trigger pull weight in between this second gen and this third gen. Okay guys, let's finish this up with some general takeaways. And typically here I like to start with price and kind of why I've held this off till the end of the video. So the standard manufacturing firearm can be purchased brand new off of standards website. I know they use some uh, some wholesalers like Bud's Gun Shop and people like that. And the base price on a revolver like this is around the $1,800 mark, uh, plus shipping and of course your FFL fees and things like that. And that is exactly the type of firearm you get here. These are the base stocks. Uh, and you can get them in the seven and a half to five and a half and the four and three quarter inch barrel, whichever you prefer. And there's no price difference between the three. You can go for the nickel finish uh, firearm. It is a little bit pricier on the nickel and base pricing. I think it's upwards to about two. I didn't double check that because I'm talking about this one, uh, but I'll look that up and roll it down below. Now from there, the pricing can go up. Again, as I've mentioned many times in this video, you can go to the two-piece checkered, or you can go to the one-piece walnut or to the faux ivory. You're gonna go up between about $150 to $250, depending on the options that you are adding there and what configuration you like. But I really just prefer this sort of two-piece basic set that you find here. And that's basically your pricing on that firearm. And interestingly enough, if you look at Colt single action armies, the pricing is all over the place. Typically you find them in about the low $2,000 range for most standard condition single action armies and lesser condition, you're gonna to be towards the bottom end of that. Pristine unopened in the original box. Of course, they go up from there. If they've got things like factory, you know, uh, you know, ivory, and there's actually a uh, firearm on gun broker right now with uh, factory ivory grips on it with the Colt medallions, you know, things like that's gonna add a bunch of money. Uh, aftermarket stag grips might detract it uh, in value any, anything you get aftermarket, but generally your $2,000 plus for a good single action army, of course, if it's something that's got pitting and rust on it with mismatched parts, you're gonna go lower than that. Uh, typically it is the first and second generation that is more desirable. In the third generation, there was a run during the Colt strike uh, which was about the through the 80s, about 1979 through 1985, somewhere in there. However, uh, the quality of the Colt went way down, and those are typically ones people avoid and don't pay as much for. But generally across the board, the single action armies continue to sort of climb in value uh, as collectible pieces. So with that being said, why would you go for a standard manufacturing over a Colt when really once you're upwards of about the 1800 and if you add different add-on grips and stuff, you're up over two, you're near the price of a second or third generation Colt single action army in decent shape. So why would you wanna go with this over an older Colt single action army? Well, I think that comes down to the purpose or the use that's intended by the buyer. Now, for somebody who wants something that is superbly manufactured in the single action line, that can be taken out and shot and enjoyed and be reliable uh, with a company that is manufacturing them today with a warranty, this is definitely the option. If you're going with something like this, you are not skimping, in my opinion, based on what I've seen. Now, again, I have not fired it and you know I wanna get out and do that, but this is just an initial tabletop review. Uh, but I've seen plenty of videos of people firing them and I know they work well. Um, but uh, if you're looking for something that is the quality of an original Colt, I think this is every bit of that, if not more. So uh, again, I would say if I had to put, and you guys have seen in this video, which I've done, if I had to put these two revolvers together and just say which one has been made better, I would go with the standard. Uh, it's just, it is uh, obviously every little detail, again, even down to the timing of the screw heads, they did not overlook in the manufacturing of this firearm. Although you can get them uh, brand new today, of course, they are made to order. So you gotta have some time for them to put it together. So these are not rolled off in a simply line like lesser expensive firearms like the Uberti offerings and such. So this really does utilize a lot of sort of hand finishing and fitment processes that were not foreign to the original Colts back in the first and second generation of guns and even now the uh, the custom shop stuff that they do. 
With that being said, you can still get a custom shop gun, at least I think you can from Colt. I went on their website and checked before doing this video. And to have them build you one brand new to your specifications is upwards of over $3,000. So you're getting in the neighborhood of almost double this. And I really do feel like the manufacturing quality of this, and obviously I have not handled a 2022 or 2023 manufactured custom shop Colt, um, this to me has got to be as good, if not better. So if you're not so interested in the collectability of it, um, the fact that it has the Colt Pony on it and you just want a really well-made single action army variant, I think this is every every bit worth it. Um, you know, so I, you know, I am a Colt owner. These are all mine except for this, which is Randy's. Um, but this is something that, you know, I wanted to add to my collection as well, just because, I mean, the aesthetics, the manufacturing of it are just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's just something that I wanted to add to. It just feels great in the hand. It feels just like a Colt when you work the action. Uh, just a gorgeous uh, firearm. Now, when we talk about the collectability, is this going to have collector value today? Probably not because they are still being manufactured. But if you look at the U.S. firearms manufacturer in the U.S. F.A. single action armies that are no longer in production, um, those, which again, are not a cold, but still not being made, those command similar prices of, you know, the second and third gen single action armies, the kind of in the low 2000 range, uh, and those aren't being made. So those are going up in value too, and are becoming somewhat collectible. And in my opinion, those weren't made as well as these. Uh, earlier on, they used, you know, a lot of uh, Uberti parts and things like that when they put them together. Later on, they would go to their own manufacturer. So, you know, again, the quality was on par, I would say. Um, but, you know, this I just really like. It's just really, really cool. Uh, and if Standard stops manufacturing them, um, then I do assume that these would go up in value as well. Now, this one is in the 2000 serial number range, and I just got this firearm. They've been manufacturing them for about four or five years or so. So to only manufacture 2000 in about the past five years uh, just goes to show that they are not churning these things out in massive numbers. So there is going to be a limited supply of them. Um, it, you know, unless standard manufacturing makes these for the next 30 years or so, I imagine at some point they would uh, stop manufacturing, maybe, I don't know, but uh, they are just really, really cool for what they are and sort of a limited sort of hand fit single action army. So, you know, for that, I totally think they're, they're worth it for the person who wants a good, beautiful looking, you know, uh, put together single action army variant. Again, if you're solely interested in collectability and things like that, and you want that cult name for a little bit more, get yourself a uh, second or third generation or even a first generation uh, single action army uh, for again, a little bit more than what you're gonna pay for this. Um, I don't think you're gonna get exactly the same quality. It's not, obviously it's a Colt, it's not horrible, um, but I think this is just a hair better in terms of its manufacturing. Uh, but again, these are undoubtedly going to keep and maintain growing in value. Uh, even though Colt's making them today custom shop and may go back to assembly line production or, or I should say more standardized production, uh, the second and first generations will never lose their value because they are first and second generation guns. Um, you know, still technically not being made. There's never going to be any more first or second generation Colts. So anyway, uh, those are just sort of my general thoughts and takeaways on these. Obviously, I'm a big fan of both. Um, I just think that the single action army in general is a wonderful uh, firearm, just a lot of uh, history and nostalgia there. So anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it off with that. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by hitting that like button. If you want to see more content like this, please subscribe to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when we are posting new content. I'm going to leave you guys off with that. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com and Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV and I will see you next time.